All heard able, please rise for the reading of God's Word. Be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 2. And so we will be finishing 1 Timothy chapter 2 this week, and then we will take a break from 1 Timothy because we're coming in on the Christmas season, and I think uh, this might be exciting to you, but the next four weeks we're going to take time and look at a particular, one of the particular Christmas carols, one in which Pastor Ben thinks is like one of the best, best. and we're going to take a look and look at the scriptural truths that are portrayed in those carols. So that's what we'll be doing the next four weeks, but today we'll be finishing up 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we will start with verse 9. Likewise also women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. This is the word of God. Hear it, believe it, live it. You may be seated. So, as we continue our series of 1 Timothy, right, how you ought to behave in God's house, we're looking at today at the role of women. We, we addressed last time when we were in 1 Timothy the role of men, and today we're on the role of women. Now, I will certainly acknowledge that this is a very testy topic that I'm about to um, engage in this morning. And I'd ask you ladies to be patient, and then also ask yourselves, perhaps, maybe you never thought of yourself as a feminist, but perhaps maybe that's a question to ask yourself about how much this offends you. But understand, we're going to work on it, we're going to talk about it, and how it applies in the reasoning, and what is Paul talking about. And so what we're going to see, so God's role for women in the church, so first, we'll, we'll, first thing we'll look at is that they're to dress in modesty and good works. Right? The second one is to follow God's leaders. And the third is to stay committed to God's role for them. And we'll talk about what that looks like. And we'll also look at how much freedom there is in this. So first, let's look at dress in modesty and good works. So Apostle says, likewise also. So remember, verse 8, he started with, right, I desire for men that they should pray, that they should live holy lives. We talked about how um, God also has ordained leadership for them in the church. So We've had this start here. So likewise also, women should adorn themselves in respectable attire with modesty and self-control. Now, self-control is what? Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Right? So men, right, exercise self-control, right, at least in the sexual realm, and what they look at and how they pursue things, right? Women, in a sense, model self-control by what? Not by how they dress. And as in a way is not to allure a man's eyes to them to themselves, right? Now there's more to it than that, but I'll put it this way, a little more bold. Women should not dress like they're sex objects. Right? In the church, women should not dress to present themselves this way. Because after all, I mean, you're coming to church to worship God, and especially if you're married, who are you trying to impress? It's really all, you're with, if you're coming with the motive to cause other men to look at you and other women to be jealous, then I think you've missed the point of church, haven't you? And we've missed godliness as well. Let's look at Proverbs 7. Proverbs 7 is actually Solomon's warning to young men to be aware of certain kinds of women. So Proverbs 7 verse 10 says, And behold, the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute wily of heart. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. So here's a woman who, in Proverbs 7, is actually married. She dressed like a harlot for the same purpose as a harlot. 
right? And she certainly is not submissive to her husband in this. And so the dangers here, the warning is to avoid these kinds of women, and this is not what uh, ties to godliness. And so here's the question, should women, you know, Paul's saying women should not dress with, women who are believers should not dress with the same values as women who are unbelievers, right? And those are multiple things, not only this apparently desire to show everything and bring attraction, but even just the idea of costly apparel, right? And, and I don't know if the point here is so much that you need to really be careful and not spend, you know, I could spend $35 on this dress, but oh my, that'd be too much. I better only spend 20 I, I don't think that's the apostle's point. The apostle's point is, I'm buying clothes again because what do I, I want to what? Make a statement when I walk into the room. Now, I'm actually somebody who actually believes, you know, dress for success. Like, I, I think, you know, you should dress well-kept and professional, particularly for certain things, right? A funeral, you'll see, you know, if you come to a funeral, I'm doing the funeral, I will have, you know, the tux thing going, you know, the jacket, right? And I don't think that's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about this idea, I need to make a presence because that's what says something about me, right? When I go to the prom, I need to have the dress on that has everybody talking. I want to be known for how I look, how I present myself. That's my identity is wrapped up in this. Okay? That's what we're driving at here. It's about showing off. It's about getting people look at me. And of course, we know, right, when we come to church, the goal is not to what? Have people look at you. The goal is for you to come to church and look at God. And if nobody else sees you, that's a good thing. And that's actually something, as an official, that's one of the things we talk about. If nobody knows we're here, we did a great job today. That the goal is in a lot of ways not to be noticed. And that is true as worshipers because the goal isn't to be noticed by everybody here. It's only to be noticed by God. And if God says, this is what I want you to do, what's probably a good way to get noticed by God? Well, you could do the opposite. He'll notice that too. But that might not be what you're driving at. Right? We want to please God. So this idea of modesty, and how we present ourselves, but rather, right, as we continue, um, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Now, there's a couple of things here. Because Paul doesn't, you know, it would be nice if Paul went into detail and said, well, you can't wear short skirts or you can't. Paul doesn't even really get into that, does he? He doesn't get into the fine details like, you know, you can only wear, you can't wear sparkly. He, you know, you can't wear, doesn't say any of those things, does he? Now, we understand, right, most of us would admit, right, would say, well, when we go to the beach and what we see there, we know that's immodest, right? And then most of us, well, you know, the lady with the, you know, the dress that comes all the way down here and is baggy, and it's like, that's clearly modest, right? But where's the cutoff in between? Well, the Bible just doesn't tell you. Right? It'd be nice if it say, well, the skirt, you know, can only come down to knee. It, it doesn't, right? It doesn't say that. But it does say a lot with attitude, doesn't it? Why am I dressing this way? What is it saying? Right? So we need to address our heart motives in many of these things, right? And where we're coming from. But rather, all right, so what's proper for women who profess what? Godliness, right? So those who profess to follow Christ with good works. And so Paul, right? So ladies, what Paul said, you don't want to be known so much by what you wear for clothes. You want to be known by your service to God, by your good works, what you do for God, how you serve him in the church. So that at your funeral, you know, the few people that show up might say, well, you know, she looked really good prom night, right? No, no, no. But rather... When you pass, your funeral will be filled with people who are like, oh, she loved me and she did this. And she served in this way and was so selfless and took me in off the street. And da, 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 da. notice none of that has to do with her dress. None of this has to do with her beauty. Our beauty, it just has to do with her love for God and her act of service to the church and to her children. That's what she should be known for. Being a good mother, loving her kids, 
This is pleasing to God. And what are some, and this to understand is nowhere near an extensive list, right? What are the good works ladies can do in the church? Visiting the sick and shut-ins, taking meals to people, teaching the younger women, helping with upkeep of the church. And you know, there's not this stiff, rigid thing of what that might look like. I mean, after all, we know Sandy did a lot of carp carpentry work here, didn't we? Right? So it's not wrong for women to do some of that kind of work, is it? I mean, the scripture here doesn't forbid that, does it? But to serve in however God has gifted you within the church and to be clothed in that and to be known for your service to God's people. And that is what is glorious for a woman. Now, follow God's leaders. Now we probably get to the most contentious part. Verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. All right, so what does Paul mean by this? So there's a couple things. So first off, when we talk about follow God's leaders, well, we know one leader, if you are, if you are here and, and you're a lady and you are married, right, one leader that God has placed in your life is your husband, right? Whether he's a believer or whether he's a non-believer, doesn't matter. God is, they are the leader in your life. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean that we necessarily would commit sin, that you'd have to commit sin if that's what your husband is demanding out of you. But it is clear, right, that he's the head. And we'll talk about that. Uh, let's go to Ephesians 5.22. Because what does that mean? So Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything, everything to their husbands. So ladies, when you do this, when you submit, submit to your husband, you are modeling the relationship between Christ and the church and how it's supposed to work. So you're actually modeling, in some respects, the gospel. Okay? Now, notice a couple things here. One is, who's the head of the church? Christ. So fellas, how are you supposed to treat your wife? Like Christ. Right? So this isn't just a, oh, I get everything I want command. This is not reducing women to property. In fact, this is actually doing the opposite. Because when Paul tells the Romans and Greeks that you're to love your wife like Christ loved the church, you die for her, that doesn't really go with their culture very well. That you are to value, that you're to treasure, that you're supposed to uplift your wife. Just as Christ treasures and values and uplifts the church. And that's another thing. Why do we as believers say this? Why do we as believers um, take these roles so seriously? And, and why do we as believers, as we're going to see, I, I do believe that Paul is forbidding women to serve in the role of pastors in the church. Why do we take that position? Well, it's as simple as this. That's what God said. That's what Jesus said. Right? And so if we are going to be successful and pleasing to God, we have to do what He says. Okay? But I think what we have to tr realize is that perhaps what God says, even though it doesn't make sense because we're in a culture that's so saturated against that, that actually we will find that we are much happier and more fulfilled when we do the thing that God has designed us for and as we'll see it doesn't mean we're somehow less of a person I think it's actually very demeaning to women to say you have to essentially be a man to have value I mean that's pretty much what our culture says you need to be you should do everything a man does because that's the only way you have value really? 
Isn't that demeaning? You know, I, I think sometimes we, we get caught up in things. I think the other thing we see here, uh, to go back to 1 Timothy, um, is one of the things he's, the apostle is driving at here. So, not to speak in church. Well, what does that mean? I don't permit a woman to speak in church. Well, women did to some extent say things in church. Okay, back then. Even back then, right? Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Or we'll, but what we're really kind of talking about is this idea of not what? Exhorting authority over. Okay? And so while I think, I do think, though, if we, if we look at this, first off, think about married women in the church. Okay, Let, let's start there and then we'll work out from there. Okay? What would be some practical reasons as to why it would function this way? Why should she ask her husband first? Like, she has a question, instead of just asking it, whether it be in Sunday school or whatever, why should she ask her husband who's presumably sitting next to her? Or go home, if, especially if, you know, we're talking about some of the Puritan churches. I'm not sure if the early church did this, but, you know, you had guys sitting over here, girls sitting over here. Go home, talk about it. Now, ladies, you might be like, I hate that idea. Right? question. What is one of the things that at least I tend to hear that ladies, you tend to complain about uh, your husbands? They won't listen. They won't talk to me. The Bible right here is actually telling you to talk to your husband and is telling him that he's supposed to listen. And he's supposed to discuss biblical things with you. Because perhaps he has the answer for your question, and boom, it's answered. And that, in some respects, clears things up in church, you know, allows things to run a little smoother. That doesn't mean questions shouldn't be asked, right? But if it being, can be cleared up here, that's great. Also, what also means there, what if your husband's like, oh yeah, you got a point. I think Pastor Ben is a little nuts. I don't think that's what the Bible says. You know, I think I'm going to ask that. And then he goes and asks that question. So it's, again, it's not that your rights are completely destroyed. It also ultimately ends up strengthening the family unit. Okay? Now, I do think that there are also then circumstances, and I haven't done the research in this in the early church, but what are the cases of widows, right? Or what if your husband doesn't come to church? It would seem like in those cases it would be okay to ask a question, but I think you still would have to be careful in not exercising authority in asking that question. Right? So, in other words, attitude. So apparently there's a little more freedom for guys to be jerks with each other, right, than ladies with guys. But again, attitude, I do think there's, there's a place for having fun too with each other, okay, uh, within the church. Now, I do think more than anything, Paul is, though, talking about particularly the role of pastor or the office of, with, you know, the church overseer or what we would call pastor, all right, an elder in that sense is forbidding women to serve in that because it's a role of teacher. And that would seem to be, is that the research I did, particularly the older group, you know, this idea of women pastors is very new. Okay, it's new. You know, say what you want, it's new. And one of the things that I've observed as the church, you know, starting with the late 1800s into early 1900s and then to where we are now, as women have taken more leadership in the church, has the church gotten stronger or weaker? I think most of us would say weaker over that time frame. Now, I don't think that's because, like, in other words, that's the only reason as to why, right? I think there's lots of reasons to that, right? I'm only talking of one as many. And this is, I want to also say in here, it's not a knock on, a, on women's ability or their talents, but it's rather an idea of roles. That we as a church function best when everybody does what God has called them and placed them to do. Okay, so I got from Clark's commentary. He says this, Let the woman learn in silence. This generally supposes to be a prohibition of women's, women's preaching. Okay, then I'm going I'm to go in now and quote some more from him. And he's actually talking about the Jews. So this first sentence actually is, is one of the uh, leaders of the... Jew, uh, would have been there. Uh, word escapes me. But leaders of the synagogue, all right, 
This is what he said. This is not what the Bible teaches. And then Clark is going to say, well, the Bible is very different than this. All right, Christianity is different and broke this norm that existed back then. So it says this. This is what he said. Let the words of law be burned rather than they should be delivered to women. All right? Totally disagree with that as does Clark. He says this, This was their condition, the condition of women, till the time of the gospel, when according to the prediction of Joel, the Spirit of God was to be poured out on the women as well as the men, that they might prophesy, teach, and that they did prophesy or teach is evident from what the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 11.5, where he lays down rules to regulate this part of their conduct while ministering in the church. All right? So he's saying that 1 Corinthians 11, we're not going to go there. That sort of kind of talks a little bit about head coverings, right? That there are rules. Why is the head covering? Because it shows you're in submission. All right? That you're not just going on your own will. That yes, you're under God's authority. Yes, you're under the church's authority. Yes, we believe what you have to say is good for everybody. But there are still rules and structure there. Okay? Because we kind of function this way, I would argue, as a church, right? Because, um, for example... Crystal Salzman from Ellis Mountains Presbyterian Care Home, right? She comes and she does Sunday school, right? And she gives a, a, a short excerpt as well in the service, but I still re, we don't, I still usually preach the message when she comes, right? Uh, I'll give you um, some others. Yeah, sometimes when, when some of our missionaries like Matt Cox comes, right? And, and he does most of the speaking, but he brings his wife up, right? And she explains what she does and what happens there. And I think that that's perfectly fine. In fact, in the way in which they do it, they show that they're in, you know, they're working together. They're showing their relationship and, and, and very good aspects, right? And that she's, you know, that their marriage is a godly marriage and it's working in, with all the bounds that which we showed. Yet she's still coming up and speaking and talking, Okay, so I, I think that is certainly not what is necessarily being pushed out here. But I'll also say that, as we'll talk about, there are some exceptions. Because I'll tell you what, even though she has passed, if Corey Ten Boom walked through that door, I would let her take as much time as she needed. And that would suffice for the message. Because in her particular instance, God had gifted her. She had gone through something incredible. And God was speaking through her and just awesome. And I would argue even abnormal normal ways. But you know what? I don't think she would come in with this attitude that women should be preachers or that you must give me the X time. I don't think that would be her attitude. She'd simply get a, give it a message and she would share it with whoever would listen. That was her attitude. Right? It was still one of submission. And so I think those are things to, we need to keep in mind. Um, we're going to skip ahead. I'm going to skip some of those notes that I have for you. You can read them from Adam Clark. He goes into more detail of moving those things about. Notice John Wesley, in regards to this passage, simply says to you... Um, to usurp, to usurp authority over the man by public teaching. That's what John Wesley said. Right? So I feel like the Wesleys have a little bit of a problem there. But I'm not going to go into that. Especially since I'm related to some of them who are here. So I don't want to get in too much trouble. Uh, John Calvin said this in his commentary about this passage. He said, But I suffer not a woman to teach, not that he takes from them the charge of instructing their family, but only excludes them from the office, and that's the key word, office of teaching, which God has committed to men only. On this subject, we have explained our views in the expositions of the first epistle to the Corinthians. If anyone brings forward by a way of objection, Deborah and others of the same class of whom we read that they were at one time appointed by the command of God to govern the people, the answer is easy. Extraordinary acts done by God do not overturn the ordinary rules of government by which he intended that we should be bound. Accordingly, if women at one time held the office of prophets and teachers in that too, when they were supernaturally called to it by the Spirit of God, he who is above all law might do this. But being a peculiar case, this is not opposed to the constant and ordinary system of government, which is what I made reference to with Corey Ten Boom, right? You know, because that's what we want. You know, one other thing we often miss with Deborah. Now, I do believe Deborah was called by God, and I believe God was working through her in incredible ways. 
But we also know that in Deuteronomy, God says that when he's, one of the signs of God's judgment is when women rule over the nation. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the woman is evil or the woman isn't serving God, because we certainly see that not to be true in the case of Deborah. And I think you can argue in the church today, some of the women pastors are actually very godly. They follow the gospel. They hold to it. Okay? Like, and I'm not going to knock them for that or say that they're not saved or that God isn't even working through them. But it's still a sign that there are things that aren't right within the church. That the church is in a bad place. So the Apostle Paul is going to continue in Timothy and give more explanation for Adam as to why this order is this way within the church. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Now notice, the woman was deceived, right, leads Adam then to take of the fruit. But yet, the Bible doesn't say through Eve, through one woman sin entered the world, does it? It says through Adam sin entered the world. See, understand too, ladies and fellas, that means your husband is going to have to be responsible, is going to give an account to God for the decisions you make as a family. Right? He's going to bear the responsibility if something is done wrong. And that's a heavy weight to bear. Also, I think something very interesting to see, when we mess up God's roles, we, we tend to fall into sin. For example, so when we look at creation, right, he gives the example of Adam, right? God makes Adam first, then he makes Eve, and then he puts them in charge of what? Creation. So the order is King Adam, Queen Eve rules with Adam. She's a helpmate, not a servant, not a slave. Rules with Adam as his helper. Okay, we want to differentiate there. And then they rule over what? Creation animals. Okay? What happens in the fall? The animal, the serpent, goes to Eve, deceives and persuades Eve to sin. Then what does Eve do? She goes to Adam and convinces and leads Adam to sin. So we see what? A complete reversal of the roles. The roles were reversed. Man leads into sin. Now, obviously, it stops when it gets to God. Boom. God puts an end to it, right? It's like, I, <laughs> I'm still the head for everybody. Let's just make that clear. Right? And so, again, so the roles within the church, we want to hold to this. And that's where I think um, women pastors have a, a bit of a, a difficulty because how can a women pastor call out the sin in the church in the world when she is clearly defying God's role for men and women in the church? Right? Because we have, as our society, we have a huge role problem right now. We don't know what the role of women are. We don't know what the role of men are. We don't know what the role of the family is. We don't know what the role of the government is. We don't know what the role of the church is. We don't know what the role, the role of anything is. Right? We don't know. You ask people, they, they literally say, what's a woman? I don't know. That's what they say, right? What's marriage? I don't know. So, the church, I would argue, probably, I, not probably, I think the church has a greater testimony when we get the roles right here in our society as opposed to getting the roles wrong in our own, in the midst of ourselves, and then telling everybody else what they're supposed to do. And so we need to focus on getting these things right in our own lives. And so as we see these rules, as I say here, stay committed to God's role for them. Because this last, these last few verses, I think, the last verse probably uh, really might be irritating to some. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Oh no, the evils of pregnancy. <laughs> Now, first off, it's important to note here, Paul is not saying that for women, the only way you can get into heaven is if you have a baby. Paul is not saying that. It is not, you know, the rest of Scripture is very clear, right? 
you're only saved through the blood of Christ. Okay? So that's not what Paul is saying here. Alright? Because we take the rest of the scripture. But I think it is interesting to note a couple things here. Notice first that she still is exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, right? If they continue in faith, love, holiness with self-control. So we see the fruit of the Spirit here. How do you get the fruit of the Spirit, right? You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? That He died on the cross for your sins. That He rose again the third day. That He's returning. And then God sends you the Holy Spirit, which enables you to do the things that you can't naturally do very <laughs> well and are hard enough to do with the help of His Spirit, right? Those things, right? She's supposed to still model those things. We also know from other places in Scripture, right, that some women are called to be single, we know that some women can't have kids. It doesn't make them less of a woman. doesn't mean they can't get saved, right? Paul's not saying that. But I think to some extent what he is saying and, or is reminding, you know, Timothy as he pastors the church is that it's not more holy to be single. It's not more holy not to have kids. Just like, you know, there's times, as, as we see, I believe, in Corinthians, where it, was, it would seem that in the church there are people who thought, well, I can serve God better as a single, therefore, I'm, even though I'm married, I should divorce and be single. And, and Paul's like, no. No, if you're married, serve God in your marriage. If you're single, serve God in your singleness. If you have kids, serve God with raising your kids. There's nothing wrong with doing the thing that God designed your body to do. Like, literally, women, your body is designed to bear children. It is designed to do that. So you shouldn't somehow feel less because you decide, and your husband, hopefully, decide to have a baby. You shouldn't feel like, oh, well, if I have a baby, then I have to give up this career, right? I won't be successful here. I won't be able to serve in church as much as this other person. You're not less holy. It's not less honoring to God. And that's so often, sadly, I feel like we, we make those mistakes, and so what I want to do here, I want to end with one example of why embracing God's rule for, for you, for women, and particularly this idea of childbearing, is so important. And this example is Duke Godfrey of Bolon. Bolon is a province, kind of, was a province, kind of, I think still in Germany, but close to the French border, okay? Duke Godfrey was a crusader. I know. Stop. Before you go, oh my goodness, Pastor Ben, you, you're talking about, you know, toxic masculinity. What does that have to do with the example of what you're talking about? And the crusaders are all evil and blah, 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 blah. The Muslims were living at peace and minding their own business. And the crusaders just decided one day to go and massacre them. <laughs> You obviously went to public school. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> that is nonsense. <laughs> right? <laughs> In fact, men at the time of the Crusades, North Africa, the Middle East, they had at one time all been Christian lands. And they were all conquered for been over 400 years. The amazing part is the Crusades didn't happen sooner. It happened sooner. All right? 400 years, the Muslims had been invading, raping, pillaging, plundering. Um, if you didn't convert to Islam, you'd be martyred, or you had to agree to pay this special tax, right? So you were in servitude to the Muslims, and even though you'd be allowed to exist, the Muslims would come in from time to time and ransack, ransack the churches. Pilgrims would come to the Holy Land, not causing any troubles, but they would just sometimes be murdered or raped along the way. The Muslims were pushing up through Spain, okay? Europe was truly afraid. Now, yes, the Pope was wrong to say that, hey, if you go on crusade, God will forgive you of your sins. That is just garbage. The people who went, hoping that going on crusade would save them from their sins, didn't make it to heaven. 
because only the blood of Christ can save you from your sins. Now, on the other hand, for people who are believers, right, and they are in a place of government leadership or in the army, you know, the Bible doesn't say you can't serve in those roles after you're a believer. Is it wrong to go and protect other people or to even retake lands that had belonged to your group of thinking? I mean, I think you can argue based on what some of the crimes that the Muslims committed that, yeah, that was within reason for them to respond with the Crusades. Now, I have in your notes two quotes from actually... Um, historic eyewitnesses, people who lived at the time of the Crusades, about some of the things that the Muslims did to men and women, some of the things they did to the mothers and made the, their daughters watch on and then they switched them. I am not going to read those quotes because we have a lot of really little ears here today. Um, and it's pretty graphic. Okay? But they're in your notes, you can read them, and you can determine for yourself how you want to explain those things to your kids, okay? Um, I do want to be careful. I do think we need to understand these things. So, with that says, so Duke Godfrey, he was one of the crusaders, him and his two brothers. He went, did some incredible things. He was one of the ones at the end who took Jerusalem, and I know, again, where everybody says, well, you know, the Crusaders slaughtered the Muslims when they took the city. True. A couple things. Now, this doesn't make it right, but that was normal practice for every army. The Muslims did those things, too. Secondly, and then they'll say, well, then the Muslims, right, they let the Crusaders, you know, when the Muslims retook Jerusalem later, they let the Crusaders walk out, the Christians walk out. Yeah, because they couldn't take the city. And they had to come to peace terms. If the Christians had come to peace terms with the Muslims before they took the city, they would have let them walk out too. Because that's how it worked. If the city didn't surrender, you wiped them out. If they surrendered, then there were peace terms. Like, that's just how things worked back then. I'm not saying that it's right. I'm just telling you that was how things functioned that way. Okay? So he goes, he ends up taking back Jerusalem after his army is exhausted and they take Jerusalem. He ends up, another Muslim army comes up from Egypt and they leave Jerusalem and they wipe out a much larger. Really cool stories about some of the things he did. But what I really want to focus on is Duke Godfrey's mother. So in the book I've been reading, um, Raymond Ibrahim talks about defenders of the West, um, the Christian heroes who stood against Islam. And so he talks about the Duke in here. He, talking about the Duke's mother, he says this. So the Duke, who was the second of three sons, Eustace the oldest, Baldwin the youngest, he was born to Eustace the eleventh of Bolin, one of the most important vassals of the King of France, and Ida, daughter of Godfrey, the Duke of Lor Lower Lorraine, whom Godfrey was named after. His mother, who was known for her piety and funding monasteries, took the best care of her children, nursing them herself, lest they be contaminated by evil influences. So she is a woman of of renown and wealth. She can have somebody else watch, nurse, take care of her kids. She says, no, they're my kids and I'm not going to let somebody else influence them to do things wrong. I'm going to make sure I'm the one from the time they're nursing to instruct my kids in what is good and what is true and what is wholesome and character. I'm going to do that. Little side note, his father actually fought um, with, with the Normans when they invaded England. Do any of you know what that is? Again, probably if you went to public school, you don't know what that is. We should all know that. So, can you again from the book? Godfrey was known for many virtues, including charity to the poor, mercy to wrongdoers, humility, clemency, sobriety, justice, and chastity. In fact, after he took Jerusalem, they wanted to make him king of Jerusalem. He refused to be king of Jerusalem. He basically took a role similar to like Lord Protector. Right? But in that, they held an election, and there was a bunch of people that were nominated. And their knights, they basically brought their knights up and they testified about the character of each person. You know the worst thing they said about Godfrey? 
He stays too long at church, asks the priest questions about religion, and then our Sunday supper is cold and tasteless when we get back to it. <laughs> that was the worst thing they came up with. He was known for being chaste. Chaste, chaste his life. Uh, then again about his mother. Last quote. The religious fervor of their mother, whose teachings seemed to have had a lifelong influence on the brothers, was especially instrumental in their joining the First Crusade. Here was a mother who loved her kids, instruct them in the truth, and because of her influence, they actually rescued part of the Holy Lamb for a time from the Muslim invaders and helped stem the tide against the West. And she never drew a sword. There is an adjective as we think about, as we go, as we look, as we look at what I want us to take home today. So ladies, remember, dress modesty and with good works. Follow God's leaders. Stay committed to God's role for you. And remember this. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Ladies, if you want to rule the world, you don't need to be president. You don't need to be pastor. You rock the cradle. This used to be understood. And it's not just a nifty saying to keep you at home. You're the one who raises that character. You get part of the credit when they go out and do amazing things. That belongs to you too. And it, I think it's just part of the paradox of Christianity, right? The thing that you don't think changes the world is actually the thing that does. And the saying, the hand that rocks the cradle, comes from a poem, and that's what's what I will, that is, I will finish with that, from William Ross Wallace, 1819 to 1881. So he just began to see the craziness that we see today. But he says this, Blessings on the hand of women. Angels guard its strength and grace in the place. Cottage, hovel, oh, no matter where the place. Would that never storms assail it, rainbows ever gentle curled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Infancy, the tender fountain, power may with beauty flow. Mothers first to guide the streamlets, from them souls on resting grow. Grow on for the good or evil, sunshine streamed or evil hurled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Woman, how divine your mission, here upon our natal sod. Keep, oh keep the young heart open, always to the breath of God. All true trophies of the ages are from mother love imperiled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Blessing on the hand of women. Father, son, and daughter cry. In sacred song and mingled with the worship in the sky. Mingles where no tempest darkens. Rain